Okay, so that's a bit about what counterfactuals are, and now I'll give you a very quick roadmap for how we're going to compute these counterfactuals, how we're going to get around the fundamental problem of causal inference. The first thing is we'll have to observe some data. So for example, for a specific person, we observe the treatment and outcome that they had. This corresponds to observing the treatment and the potential outcome y little t, where little t is the specific observed value of big T, right? This is by consistency. Then the main ingredient that we'll need is a parametric model for the structural equation for y. So we'll only be able to get the correct counterfactual if we have a correct parametric model for this structural equation for y. And this is a pretty big ask to have a correct parametric model. We'll see that we don't need it later on if we don't care about unit level or individual level counterfactuals, but for now, by counterfactual we mean the thing at the individual level. For you, would you have gotten a headache had you not taken the treatment? And then with this observation and this correct parametric model, the result is that we can access counterfactuals. So we observed yt, but then we can access the counterfactuals yt prime at the unit level, so for individuals. We'll start with a very simple example. In this example, y corresponds to whether or not a person is happy. So y equals 1 means happy, y equals 0 means unhappy. And the treatment of interest is getting a dog. t equals 1 means getting a dog, t equals 0 means not getting a dog. So we're interested in the causal effect of getting a dog on happiness. And in this example, there are two different types of people, which we'll describe using u, this unobserved variable. So the first type is a dog person, that's u equals 1. And the second type is an anti-dog person, that's u equals 0. Here's the corresponding structural causal model. We don't need a structural equation for t, because t's structural equation is unimportant. It can be whatever. In other words, people can decide whether or not to get a dog to based on whatever, it doesn't matter. But the structural equation for y is what's important here. So this structural equation tells us that if they're a dog person, so if u is 1, then their happiness will just be equal to the treatment. So if they get a dog, they'll be happy. If they don't get a dog, they won't be happy. And if they're not a dog person, so if u equals 0, then this term will cancel out. And then their happiness will be the opposite of the treatment. So if they don't get a dog, then they'll be happy, and if they do get a dog, then they'll be unhappy. Okay, so that's the setting we're considering in this very simple example. Then we observe that a person does not get a dog and is unhappy. So for this unit, where their big U is equal to little u, we know that when they don't take treatment, they are unhappy. So we know this potential outcome, the y0 potential outcome at the unit level. And we want to know the unit level counterfactual. In other words, what would be this person's happiness if they had gotten a dog? And the main thing we'll use here is this structural equation for y. So we can solve for the specific value of u for this person. And then we'll be able to use that to get their counterfactual. So the first thing is we just take that structural equation. It gives us this equality. Then we plug in the observation, so t equals 0, y equals 0, we plug those in to this equation. Simplifying things down a bit, we have that 0 equals 1 minus u, which tells us that this person's specific value of u is 1. So then since we have u, we can write down this sort of individualized SCM for this person, which is step 2. We just plug in 1 for u in the above SCM. So this structural equation for y simplifies down into y equals t. And then the specific potential outcome that we're interested in is where t equals 1. So we just plug in that for the structural equation for t. Then this individualized SCM tells us the potential outcome y1 for this specific unit. This 1 here goes there. And then the value of y is just the value of t. So we get 1 for this potential outcome. Great, so that's it. We've computed this person's counterfactual. And then we could even use this to get their individual treatment effect. What we did on the last slide was a specific example, but there are general steps for this. 
I take these from chapter four of Proetol's primer. The first step is abduction. So that's where we use an observation for an individual to determine that individual's value of you. Then we can use this to get the person's individualized SCM. Then in the second step, we modify that SCM by replacing the structural equation for t with the little t that we're interested in for that potential outcome that we're interested in. Then in the third step, we use the value of u from step one and the modified SCM from step two to compute the value of the counterfactual. This brings us to our first question of this lecture, which is, given the observation t equals one and y equals zero, compute the counterfactual y zero for this individual given the following SCM. Although we were able to determine the exact value of the counterfactual with probability one in the previous example, we can't always do that. So even if we have the structural equation for y, we can't always determine counterfactuals with probability one. So for the structural equation for y, if it's a function of u and t, and if we fix the value of t, then it's a function from u to y. And we need to be able to invert that function from u to y in order to solve for u from this structural equation for y. As an example, consider this structural equation. Here there are four different values that u could take on. It could take on the usual values that we saw last time, which are the dog hater and dog neater values, in which case the value of y is just equal to the value of t if you're a dog neater, and it's the opposite value of t if you're a dog hater. But here we also have two more values of u. So y could just always take on the value of one. That's for people who are always happy. Or y could always take on the value of zero, regardless of the treatment. So that's for people who are never happy. Then to see why we can't solve for u here, consider a specific observation. So here we get a dog, we def treatment equals one, and then we observe that we're unhappy. So y equals zero. And then we want to solve for u here. We want to know which u this specific unit is. And we can't know. This unit could be either a never happy person or a dog hater, right? We can't uniquely determine the value of u here. Okay, so what do we do in non-invertible examples like this? So in this example, we have the potential outcome under treatment one, and we know that it's equal to zero and we're interested in the potential outcome under treatment zero. What we need to do is write down some sort of prior distribution for you. So in this example, we might have studied the population a bit and have some prior knowledge on them, which we can then encode in these probabilities, right? So 30% of the population is always happy, 20% is never happy, 40% will be happy if they have a dog, unhappy if they don't have a dog, and then the remaining 10% will be unhappy if they have a dog and happy if they don't have a dog. And really, we only needed the probabilities for the never happy in the dog hater groups because those are the potential values of u that this specific unit could be. So in the invertible case, we used this observation to tell us exactly what the value of u is. And in this case, we're going to use the observation to update our distribution of u. So we just apply Bayes' rule here, and we get that the probability that this person is a never happy person is two thirds, and the probability that this person is a dog hater is one third. Okay, so this is gonna be very useful, this new distribution of u, and remember that the thing we're interested in is this counterfactual, y zero. So what would y zero be if this person is a never happy person? Then y zero would be zero, because they're never happy. Y is always gonna be the value of zero. And what would this counterfactual be if this person were a dog hater? Then, because they're not taking the treatment, so t is zero here, then y would be one. Okay, so that means that this counterfactual takes on the value of one with probability one third, and takes on the value of zero with probability two thirds. So that's what we get in this example. We don't get the counterfactual with probability one, right? Not all the probability is concentrated on one value of the counterfactual, but rather we get this distribution for the counterfactual.
And there's three general steps for this probabilistic counterfactuals case as well, also taken from chapter four of Pearl's Primer. The first step, instead of being able to uniquely determine the value of u, we just update the distribution of u given some observation z. Then the second step is exactly the same. We just replace the value of t with the specific little t that we're interested in for the counterfactual. And then step three is almost the same in that we're still combining steps one and two, but now we'll get a non-degenerate distribution for the counterfactual. In other words, it'll not place all of the probability on one value for the counterfactual. All right, so we've now seen some pretty cool things, how we can get around the fundamental problem of causal inference, how we can actually infer counterfactuals. But in order to do this, we needed a parametric model for the structural equation for y. Without it, we wouldn't be able to compute these unit level counterfactuals. So when I've been saying counterfactuals so far, I've meant unit level counterfactuals. And having such a parametric model is a pretty strong assumption. But without making this strong assumption, we're stuck with the fundamental problem of causal inference. In other words, we can't observe both unit level potential outcomes. Or in the non-binary treatment case, we can't observe more than one unit level potential outcome. We'll see that we don't need this strong assumption if we don't care about the unit level, but we care about the population level. But first, I have this following question for you. Given the observation t equals 1 and y equals 0, compute the counterfactual y0 for this individual given the following SCM and prior. So we saw that without a parametric model for the structural equation for y, we can't compute counterfactuals at the unit level. But if we care about the population level, then we don't need such a parametric model. So what do I mean by the population level? Now we're not talking about y, u for a specific unit, specific individual. Rather, we're talking about the expectation over the whole population. And it's counterfactual because this t does not match this t prime here. So we've actually seen this before. So we are able to identify the average treatment effect non-parametrically, so not using a parametric model. We are able to identify that using just the causal graph. And we can do the same with population level counterfactual quantities if they're identifiable. And we saw that we could identify conditional average treatment effects with just the causal graph as well. For general identification of counterfactual quantities, see this paper from 2019 by Malinsky et al., where they come up with what they call the potential outcome calculus, which is a generalization of due calculus for identifying counterfactual quantities. Right, so due calculus is for identifying quantities with the due operator in them, which are quantities that are not counterfactual. But you can have a similar calculus for counterfactual expressions, as they do in this paper. Okay, but so the important part of this slide is that we don't need a parametric model to identify counterfactual expressions that are at the population level. And I'll kind of show that to you in basically the most important application of counterfactual analysis, which is mediation. 